Hey, what's up? It's Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it's time for the 49th episode of Goulet Q&A. I just realized I forgot to silence my phone, so give me a second. Don't want to get interrupted in the middle of this, because this is important, you know? Not really. Um, <laughs> if you've seen this before, which I'm guessing at this point, if you're watching it, you probably have already seen any of the previous 48 of these. Um, I take all kinds of random questions about fountain pens, ink, paper, all that kind of stuff and answer them to the best of my ability. Um, got a bunch of questions this week. I'm not gonna be able to answer everybody, but I'm answering as many as I can, okay? Um, so I got a good number of them. Before I get all into them though, just kind of give you an update on what's going on in my life and around the Goulet shop. Um, I was able to, to take my kids to the beach for the first time this past weekend. Rachel and I took a long weekend, and that's part of why some of the like um, publishing of the videos got a little screwy because I didn't really have my junk together before I left. I, I, I got everything filmed and all that stuff, but on the publishing side of things, I just forgot to flip a couple switches. We had some communication uh, things going on here, but you know, it's okay. We learned from it. We're going to take care of that in the future. Um, I'm still kind of transitioning from like kind of doing a lot of stuff myself. I'm trying to get my team to help me out more. Um, and I have to document things better and just that kind of stuff. You know, as a company grows, it's, it's hard to kind of like give things away when you've been doing it for so long. So I'm working on that. You know, if you notice, we're doing some, some new video formats and whatnot. Jenny's been tremendous helping me with all that. We're making some really good strides. Got some cool stuff going on with videos. Um, video content's been coming out a little more regularly. If you've noticed, um, Jenny's been a tremendous help in that respect. Um, <clears throat> also had Caitlin, she's on our customer care team. She just recently got engaged this past weekend. So that's super exciting. There's definitely like something in the water around here, I swear. Everybody's like getting married and having babies and all that stuff. We've got a pretty young team here, so it's not unusual in that stage of life where we are. But, you know, that's just a kind of like cool aspect of what we're doing here now. Um, you know, when Rachel and I started this company, we didn't really think about like what kind of impact we would have on future team members and stuff like that. We were really just kind of like survive and do our own thing. but. Definitely as we've grown a little bit, that's been something that has been one of the more rewarding aspects of what we do is the fact that we're able to kind of like help people to basically live their lives. So that's really cool. Just even in our own way, our own small way, just being able to influence and, and allow people to kind of do what they do. It's really cool. Um, let's see here. Next week, this is kind of a random logistical thing, but if you're shopping on gouletpens.com next Wednesday, we're gonna be doing our quarterly physical inventory. We got about 3,000 products, uh, different product SKUs, and then you know obviously lots of of quantities of some of those products. So we have to um, count things because you know random quantities get off, and then we oversell things, or we have things that we could be selling that aren't online, and and so you know it's a lot of logistical stuff to take care of. So it helps just once a quarter for us to shut the website down, stop taking orders count every single product that we have, make sure the quantities are right, and then come back online with correct quantities of everything. So um, we used to do it annually, and then we started doing it quarterly a couple of years ago, and that's really helped to keep us kind of on track. We really try to be diligent about keeping all of our stock accurate. Um, and this quarterly inventory thing is one thing that helps with that. But we have to take our entire website down in order to be able to make that happen. Because as you can imagine, if we were taking orders while we're trying to count everything, that would be a logistical mess. So um, it'll be down. We got a lot of people on hand to be able to help with that. So it's probably just a few hours on Wednesday morning that's gonna be down, but you know, probably from around like nine to 12, something like that, Eastern time that will be down. But just a heads up in case you're curious about that. Um, and then just a couple updates on some random products that are coming in. We just got, you know, Faber-Castell Pilot E95S. That's really cool. Um, have been getting a lot of questions about some other things like the Twisby 580 USA. Um, that one is gonna be coming early to mid-October. Still don't have like an exact date for that, but it should be just a few weeks. It's been pushed back and pushed back and, and all that. But that one, you know, just be patient. When it comes, it comes. And uh, that's gonna be a one-shot deal, you know? So um, you gotta be ready for that. Uh, and then Pilot Vanishing Point uh, Limited Edition for 2014 is gonna be coming out. It's a copper finish. It's kind of leaked out there. We don't have it on our site yet because we're still kind of actually kind of waiting on like the official like go ahead to put it on there. I think we might just list it anyway because it's like it's been leaked out there and other other retailers and stuff have it on their site. So it's like, all right, come on. Do we really need to wait for like the official word if everybody else has got it up there already? I don't know. We try to be like really, you know, really, um, I'm not gonna say obedient, but we try to be like really compliant and, and 
you know, want to represent the brands that we carry well. So we try to get like the official word before we can announce certain things. We're not trying to like leak it out and be the absolute first and then like burn bridges with our manufacturers and stuff. We want to be, you know, sure that it's, you know, we're doing things the way that they would like it to be done. And it's hard with a global market sometimes because stuff gets leaked through all these crazy channels and whatnot. But anyway, so that pen will be coming out, um, you know, we were told originally like late September, early October. So it shouldn't be too much longer for that. Um, I don't have an exact date uh, quite yet, but anyway, that'll be coming uh, pretty soon. So that'll be pretty neat. Um, okay, so that's about all like the logistical update kind of stuff that I've got going on right now. So um, what the heck, let's just go ahead and get into some questions, okay? At Y2BD on Twitter said, I've found that inks are that are sheen heavy, sheen heavy, tend to smear easily even after days of drying. Is this to be just to be expected? Okay, so I'm thinking about like inks, some of my, my favorites that are heavy sheen inks, uh, like Diamond Majestic Blue, love that one. Um, Jerobon Rouge Hematite, that's another one. There's some other ones, Diamond Sherwood Green's got a bit of a sheen to it. There's some PR inks like, um, you know, Electric DC Blue, New there's Autumn Azure's got some sheen to it. Ones like that. So basically a sheen is when you put a lot of ink down and then it gets kind of the shimmery, like fleck kind of uh, thing going on with it. Or you might see some like iridescent colors kind of coming through. Um, that tends to happen more with like certain dark blues and some dark greens will get kind of a reddish or purplish sheen to them. Those are the most popular, uh, the most common ones. Um, and in my experience, it's definitely been that these heavy sheening inks just smear more, just period. So, you know, for me, it's like, I don't use an ink like Majestic Blue or whatever in, you know, a notebook that I'm going to be carrying around that I'm going to be thumbing through all the time. You know, that I'll use more in like a journal that I'm, I'm sitting down and much more intentional about, um, you know, what I'm doing. Or I might use it just for like notes that I'm going to kind of toss and it doesn't really matter, like brainstorming type thing, you know, that kind of stuff. Or I might do a handwritten letter that I'm going to be mailing and then it's gone. Uh, you know, so it's, it's that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm a little conscious of those particular inks. You know, they're a little high maintenance for some people to worry about, so they may just not want to deal with them. But um, for me personally, I love the sheens, and so for what I use them for, I'm just a little more conscious about it. Um, and it helps when you have kind of a variety of pens and you can keep that, that ink in just one pen and use it kind of for those occasions. And it's not like a general, it's not like a, a set rule, I guess, that like anything with a sheen is gonna smear like crazy. I just found that that's kind of more of what actually ends up happening because the the sheening basically happens when you have a lot of ink that kind of pulls up the the sheen stuff kind of like dries on the surface of paper it doesn't really soak in if it's soaked in it wouldn't have that kind of sheening appearance so it's really when you have a lot of that ink that is drying on the surface of the paper that's where you get that sheen so it's kind of more of the sheen is actually like a physical effect of what the ink is actually doing than than you know anything else if it was truly absorbing all into the paper it wouldn't sheen because then it wouldn't have like a smooth surface to reflect a lot of light it would just absorb into the paper and the light would get diffused because paper kind of at the molecular level is actually a very rough surface so anyway and not to mention too you're gonna get more of a sheen on the papers like rhodia clairefontaine those really smooth papers that have a more of a tendency to want to smear anyway so it's kind of like the smearing is actually kind of a consequence of having a smoother surface with more ink on the page. That's where you're gonna see those sheens come out more, but it's, it's, it's the same thing that's gonna happen. You know, you're, you're gonna get more smear where you have that effect happening. Uh, Jasper B on Facebook asked a question last week and then kind of pestered me about wanting to answer it again this week. So I'll go ahead and indulge here. Um, thinking about getting a Pelican pen in their M series, but I don't know if it should be an M600 or an M800. I'm afraid of the size of the pen. It looks like the 600 is mostly cap and not much pen, but I hear a lot of people say that the 800 goes in the totally other direction and that it is much bigger than you would expect. I love the size of my Namiki Falcon and my Aurora style, and the 18 karat nib is pulling me more towards the 800 than the 14 karat nib on the 600. What are your thoughts? Okay, um, well, I actually have one of each here that I can show in comparison to size. It sounds like you got two different things going on. You're worried about kind of the size, and then you're worried about the nib and kind of the way that it writes. Um, so let me zoom in, super high tech here, right? 
uh, just to show you these pens a little bit closer up. Okay, so I've got uh, this M800 um, blue that I've had for years. Um, then I got an M605 um, marine blue. This, this is a special edition thing, but it's the same size as an M8 and M600 would be. So size wise, the 800 and the 600, there is definitely quite a difference, um, kind of just all around. It's definitely longer. The cap itself is bigger. The body is actually not that different. And I'll show you when I unscrew them. You're gonna get more cap on the M800 than you will on the M600. Um, but uh, the weight is gonna be much different and the diameter overall is bigger. So there's a huge difference between the 600 and 800. Not as much a difference between the 400 and the 600. Um, so if I actually take these things out, um, show you the actual bodies of the pen here, you can see there that the nib size is going to be bigger on the M800 than it will on the M600. Um, the weight is significantly different. The pen, um, the M600, the whole pen is uh, about 18 grams, and the M800 is 29 grams. So it's more than 50% uh, difference in weight. Um, diameter and all that stuff. But you can see the body of the pen is actually not that different. So if you're writing with it, it's really not going to feel... Uh, all that different in terms of its length and whatnot, um, but the weight is gonna be the most significant difference. Um, and then as far as the nib goes, um, you know, the whole 18 karat versus 14 karat, I don't know how much that particularly makes a difference. Um, it's, it's to me, it's, it might be more just the, the way that it's kind of um, ground or that um, the, the size of the nib too could also be a factor. So, you know, but I think, I don't know. I can't say that it's going to write like your your Aurora style. I don't. I'm not familiar with that pen. The Mickey Falcon. If you've got a soft nib, that's going to be just kind of a whole different thing. You really can't compare that to either of these because it's a soft nib. It's ground differently. It's designed differently than than these ones are. Um, but I find both of these to write very pleasantly. Um, I do like the 800 just a little bit more. Um, personally, but it's really going to come down to preference of do you like a larger pen or not. I am inclined to say that you're going to like the M600 more because it's going to be closer in size and weight to what your Falcon is that you're used to. The M800 is going to be quite a jump up and if you are already showing concern about the size of the pen, then I would say it's probably going to be too much for you. Not to mention it's more expensive. So, you know, maybe uh, give the M600 a look. All right. Ben C on Facebook. Hi, Brian. I recently got asked this by a colleague and wanted to know your thoughts on the issue. Is it less expensive, more expensive, or approximately the same expense to own and use a fountain pen versus a rollerball pen or a Pilot GT, G, G2 or something similar? I said it was less expensive based off the usage of my Twisby 580 and Noodler's Black after about 30 weeks. I know it's dependent on a lot of different variables, so we assumed a rollerball lasted two months and that the fountain pen needed refilled bi-weekly. Okay, so this is really gonna depend on a lot of different things. As you mentioned, the cost of the fountain pen that you're buying, the cost of the roller pens that you're buying, um, you know, the consumption rate that you're going through is going to make a huge difference. Um, the type of ink that you're buying, because ink can vary in price quite a bit. The type of paper that you're using regularly, because a more absorbent paper is going to use more fountain pen ink than a less absorbent one. So all of those things are going to come into play. So I'm just going to speak kind of generally here. Um, in general, though, for the ink consumption alone, you're paying a significant premium for gel rollerball ink, okay? Even for ballpoint ink, you're actually paying a premium. For the amount of ink that you're actually getting, for the use you're getting out of it, you're paying much more for that ink than you would for fountain pen ink. Now that said, you have the investment of the pen, whatever cleaning supplies, your time, and all that kind of stuff. So there's a reason that fountain pens are not the most dominant used writing instruments today, right? There's a reason that ballpoints and gel roller balls are a lot more popular. They're just a lot more convenient, right? Um, that's, they're just, uh, for the strict utility sake, you know, they're a lower cost up front to buy them. You can buy them in bulk and they make them in bulk, which then makes them less expensive because they're making them in bulk and so on. So as far as the pens go, it's like not a debate. Gel and ballpoints are cheaper. However, over the long haul, if you're sticking with a reliable fountain pen and using it for a long period of time, you will come out ahead. Um, that, now that said, if you're like me and you get the fountain pen bug and you end up buying a hundred or more fountain pens, 
obviously it is not going to save you any money. Um, same thing goes with ink. If you fall in love with ink or paper or whatever and you end up just getting a whole collection of it and you end up with 50 bottles of fountain pen ink that you could never use even if you wrote every single day for the rest of your life, well, that's just the kind of thing that, you know, it's like any other hobby. Like the more you get into it, it's not, it doesn't necessarily become strictly for the cost savings. But if that is your goal to strictly just save money on writing, you can do that with fountain pens. Yes, absolutely you can. Okay. And uh, to kind of piggyback off of Ben's question here, I got a question from Andrew H on Facebook that said, Brian, thanks again for these wonderful Q&A sessions. They're very informative. You're welcome, Andrew. Uh, small question, context first. I'm using the Lamy Safari charcoal with the extra fine nib. I will, in the next few weeks, be buying another Lamy Safari from your company. I want to start using bottled ink because I've noticed that using a cartridge each week is not very cost effective. Now, the small question, you talk about saving money using bottled ink versus cartridges. If I'm only using up a cartridge each week and then move up to use the bottled ink, how much money will I be saving each month? The amount of writing will vary from time to time, but I average one cartridge per week. How long will a bottle, let's say of three ounce X, um, um, noodlers, I guess, last me? Thanks again. I'm using noodlers as an example because they're the ones that sell three ounce bottles of ink. Okay, you didn't specifically say noodlers, but I'm gonna make that assumption. Okay, so I have to make some assumptions here based on cost and the numbers you gave me here. I feel like I'm back in school with all these examples. Um, okay, so you got Lamy, Lamy pen, right? And right now you're using Lamy cartridges. They're $4 for a five pack of cartridges. You're using one a week, so that's five weeks worth. So you're paying 80 cents a week right now for your ink consumption. You know, forget the pen, everything else, just purely based on your ink, you're paying 80 cents a week. Um, a cost of a three ounce bottle of, a normal three ounce bottle of Noodler's Ink, $12. Um, no wait, 12.50, sorry, oh shoot, I think I did my math wrong. Give me one second here, it is 12.50, isn't it? Darn it, I can't believe I did my math wrong with that assumption, okay, 12.50, geez, all right. This is gonna be rounded, okay? <laughs> I did all this math. I don't know why I thought it was $12. Anyway, $12.50, okay. So that would equal about 15, 16 weeks worth of cartridges, right? The cost of one bottle of Noodler's Ink versus what you're paying with Lamy cartridges, okay? One cartridge is gonna be about one milliliter of ink, maybe a little bit more, actually. The Lamy cartridges are, are a little bit bigger than the standard international cartridges. So again, I'm just, I'm rounding here, making kind of an assumption because there's all kinds of assumptions based on, you know, the weight of your hand that you're pressing and like all these other things, the type of paper you're using, blah, 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 blah. That can all affect consumption rate. But um, a three ounce bottle of Noodler's Ink is about 90 milliliters of ink. Um, so that would be, if, if we're assuming that you're using about one milliliter of ink a week, then that would be 90 weeks for a three ounce Noodler's bottle, um, which that would, making the assumption that you be, are consuming one Lamy cartridge per week, that's 80 cents, and then you would be using, uh, that would, you'd run out after about 15 weeks um, for that cost of the Noodler's Inc., where the Noodler's Inc. would last you 90 weeks, so the 90 weeks of Noodler's Inc. would cost you in cartridges about $72. So that 1250 bottle of ink is saving you about $60 worth over the life of that bottle of ink, okay? Now, some of my math might not be completely dead on there, but you get the idea. Even with the same pen and all that, going with bottled ink is going to be much more cost effective than cartridges. There is no question about that. It is a convenience that you're paying for with cartridges. Not to mention the fact, especially with something proprietary like Lamy, you can only use Lamy cartridges. I think Monteverde makes some cartridges that fit into Lamy pens, but even still, then it's just, it's still a limited selection of ink. Whereas bottled ink, you can get 600 or more different colors. So you really open up the doors in terms of your selection, um, but you're losing a little bit of convenience, I guess. Uh, you can always carry cartridges with you though, and then just like pop them in if you need to, as you're, you know, if you're, if you're on the road or whatever. Um, but you know, for just regular normal consumption, it is definitely more cost effective to go with a bottle. So that was just kind of a rough example. I'm like a little rusty on my math. It's been a few years since I've been out of school, but you get the idea, okay? So overall cost effectiveness we're talking about, but, but again, it's the same kind of thing. Like you're gonna buy a bottle of ink and you'll be like, oh man, this is really cool. I'd like to get some samples. I'd like to try a couple other bottles. And then it's the kind of thing like you're ending up with 10 bottles and you're like, man, is this really cost effective anymore? Well, no, but you are enjoying a hobby and that you're, you're you know, getting to enjoy a lot of different types of ink and stuff like that. So it's the kind of thing like you need to, you need to, 
really stick to your guns if cost effectiveness is your ultimate goal. But if you're like me, that cost effectiveness tends to kind of go out the window once you really get into the hobby. But anyway, <laughs> Emily P on Facebook had a question. The cap to my pilot plumix got stuck and refuses to twist open. Help! Um, well, Emily, um, that plumix, I mean, it's, I call that the squid pen because it's got kind of that little swoop thing. I have one around here somewhere. I would have to go dig in that drawer for a, a few minutes to try to find it though. Um, honestly, you're just going to have to twist the living daylights out of it to get that thing. I mean, unless you glued it on or something like that, it's plastic. So in the plastic, you know, if you screwed it on really tight, it's going to grip really tight, but you should be able to pop that thing off, you know, and it's worst case, it's not that expensive a pen, you know, it's, I forget the exact price, $9, something like that. It's pretty inexpensive. So even if you broke it and you had to replace it, it's not the end of the world. So just give it a, give it a good try. Um, you know, use a rubber glove or a rubber band or something like that, trying to give you some extra grip, but just twist the living daylights out of it. Ezekiel L on Facebook. Hey Brian, what's your, fa what's your favorite fountain pen made by Noodler's Inc? Um, it will be the Neponset once I get that thing in my hand. I know I'm going to love that pen. Um, love big pens, flex music, maybe it's going to be sweet. Um, however, I don't have that pen yet. And, you know, it's still a couple of months out. Um, so if I had to say right now, I really like the acrylic Conrad's. That acrylic acetate material is great. I used to make pens out of that years ago, back when I used to make pens. I don't anymore, so don't email me asking if I do and I have any leftover that I can sell you. I don't. Um, but uh, I really like that material. It's just, you know, that's what the Edison pens are made out of and a lot of other pen companies make out of that acetate material. Um, but I like that and the Baikal is my favorite color. Of course, we had like one shipment of Baikal a year and a half ago. Haven't gotten restocked on it. We just got some back in, like a handful of them. I think we still have some on our site now, which like five minutes after this video posts, I probably won't have any more because they'll all be gone. But you know, it's a blue pearlescent acrylic. You know, it's, it's, I just totally, I'm so head over heels for blue. You know, that would be, that would be my favorite. <clears throat> Edgar H on Facebook. What's your favorite Lamy ink color? Uh, also, I have an idea for the Q&As. It seems you have not enough time to answer all the questions you want to, so I was wondering that if it might help if instead of just open forum videos every week, you make something specific like paper forum, ink forum, etc. Um, okay, so you got two questions. Let me address the first. Favorite Lamy ink color? There's not a ton of them. Lamy turquoise would be my favorite. Um, so the Q&A thing, okay. So if you go back and you look on Ink Nouveau, you can see I've got a history of every every Q&A that I've ever posted and uh, all of the topics. And if you look on there, especially in the beginning, there were all kinds of topics. I covered paper, I covered all kinds of different things. Um, and the intention there was, you know, I started doing the open forum, I was getting random questions and I was like, hmm, maybe it would be better if I kind of like, to make it more referenceable, I did paper questions, ink questions and so on. And then I started like brands like Noodler's, Pilot, Monteverde, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's what I started doing. And then as I did those, it was like, great. But then as I kind of like got to more and more obscure topics, I was getting fewer questions and I was having to really kind of like scrape the bottom of the barrel for questions um, and stretch out my answers and stuff. So I, you know, the Q&A open forum definitely gets me the most questions, which allows me to, you know, I'm not able to answer everybody's question every week, but sometimes the questions I get are not either in my area of expertise where I feel comfortable really talking about it in depth, um, or it's something that is maybe um, something I've already covered before and so, or touches too much on something I've covered before, so I don't wanna cover it again. Uh, or it's something that I, uh, is just like too, too deep or too specific that I would need a lot more personal kind of situational information to be able to give an intelligent answer and it wouldn't be as relevant to kind of the general uh, audience, I guess, of whoever's watching this. So there's certain types of questions that I just don't leave out. And if you like write a whole dissertation in your question, like I can't read all that in Q&A, like you gotta pare it down, you know, make them smaller questions. The shorter and simpler and more pun pungent your question is, the more likely I am going to be able to answer it. Um, so it's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, I like to have a variety of questions so that I have the ability to kind of choose based on how things are going to flow and what I'm, you know, most comfortable answering, what's most relevant to the most number of people. 
Um, so things like doing these paper forming forms, stuff like that. Yeah, I definitely could do that. I could revisit that and do them again, ones that I've already done before, you know, like talking about paper and ink and stuff like that. Uh, I'll be honest though, I, you know, when I did paper before, I really didn't get that many questions. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing, like I never know what questions I'm going to get. And if I put a topic out there and I don't get enough questions, then it's like, what do I do? Answer five questions and end Q and A after 10 minutes, you know, I mean, maybe that's what I need to do, but I don't know. I'd love to know what you guys think. You know, if you think I should do more topical kind of stuff, I'd done that for a while. And in the last 10 or 12 Q and A's or so, I've just kind of done open forum because I've been getting a lot of questions and I feel like it's been still pretty good. I like the flow of it. So, um, you know, you just guys, you guys let me know. Let me know in the comments. I'm curious to know. Uh, Laura P on Facebook, what pen would you suggest for someone who loves fountain pens, but is basically terrified to purchase, let alone use one? That would be me. <laughs> gosh, Laura. Terrified? Oh, gosh, come on. Uh, it's okay. First thing I would say is don't be, don't be scared. You know, they're just pens. It's not, the, it's not the end of the world. You know, you can start out with an inexpensive pen that's not a huge investment. Um, I did a fountain, you can watch the entire Fountain Pen 101 series. That should be able to give you a really strong basis of education. Um, go to inknuveau.com. I've got a menu button up there for Fountain Pen 101 it's like two hours worth of videos that I've put together that take you through everything, you know, years that I had to trudge through forums and stuff and spilled ink everywhere and had to make all these mistakes to get the information that I put into those videos. So that alone should eliminate all of your fright that you have about getting into fountain pens. Uh, but that said, I've got some good recommendations for you. Um, you know, uh, I've got um, a couple of videos that you could look into about like some of the basic pens. I've got one that's called, uh, let's see here. I think I might've actually had another question of somebody asking me um, uh, top five fountain pens for newbies. Okay, so that's a good video. You can search for that on YouTube or go on Ink Nouveau and search for that. Um, that's a good one to go into, you know, but Pilot Metropolitan is kind of like my go-to. It's a $15 pen, not a huge investment. It's pretty straightforward and simple to use. Got a, several videos on that pen. Um, and that one should help to keep you, you know, keep your feet on the ground getting into this whole fountain pen thing, but you can do it. You know, it's, it's okay. It's not as scary as it seems, especially once you get into it, you'll get a little ink on your fingers. You might spill some ink. It's, it's okay. It's okay. No one will die. You know, it's just fountain pens. All right. Christine D on Facebook. Is there a listing of Diatrementus people and flower inks as they correspond to the standard line? I've been poking around a bit and don't believe that the name on the side of the bottle is always the standard color. For example, Alexander Hamilton says Aubergine on the bottle. But it's not clear that if Aubergine, the ink, or if Diatrementus is just saying that Alexander Hamilton is, ink is Aubergine, the color. Okay, yes, I agree, Christine. This is super confusing, and it's super confusing for us, too. There is no master list of this, this thing, and if there was, I would be telling it to everybody. So basically, the only option for me to share any type of list for you is to go through and, like, either test all the inks myself. So I've got my mic wire that is, like, tickling me here. That's why I keep pulling on my shirt. Um, I've got, you know, all these inks, and some of them look similar. Some of them don't. I don't I don't know any of the, the properties. I'm not given like a properties list or MSDS or anything of these inks. So I don't really know how identical they are to each other. I've got the same information you guys have. I'm looking in the swab shop. I'm seeing them. Some inks will say some information about it. I do know that there's a lot of overlap between some of these like historical, like the people inks and the flower and stuff like that. The flower ones are all scented though. So that right there, um, is is a major differentiation it's not just the color it's the smell um, but the people inks and, st and stuff like that um, sometimes those are the same as colors in the standard line sometimes they are not using the swap shop to compare them on googlepens.com is kind of the best way to, to view that and in a perfect world i would be able to sit down and do that for you and provide you with that information however i just have not been able to make the time to do that so it's been something that's been kind of requested and I agree it is kind of frustrating that it's not like that, but you know, that's just a compromise I've had to make with a lot of the other, the other things I've had going on around here. So that's the best that I have for you is that sometimes it's the same and sometimes it's not. And I just, you know, the guy who makes the ink doesn't even speak English. So like for us to get like really good information like that is just really hard. So we kind of are just left to our own devices to be able to do it just like you are. 
Rob P. on Facebook. Okay, Rob wrote me a super long question, but I'm gonna paraphrase here. I cut out some of the beginning of it. Sorry, Rob. Um, but you said, basically, how soft is the Falcon nib compared to the nib creeper, the Noodler's nib creeper, under normal writing pressure? I use moderate pressure and find that the nib creeper will not flex if I write normally. Is the Falcon nib much softer? I know you have a slightly heavier hand, so I'd be interested in your opinion, thanks. Okay, Rob, um, well, both, both of the pens are going to, I find they write somewhat similarly, okay? The Falcon might be a little bit softer, but the Falcon, for me, it's a soft nib, it's not a flex nib. Um, you can definitely get line variation with the Falcon. Obviously, if you know anything about the Falcon, you can do that. Um, we're talking about the Pilot Falcon here, formerly known as the Namiki Falcon. They're transitioning brands, but anyway, same pen. Um, that pen with normal writing pressure is not going to flex. So it's gonna be kind of the same as the Noodler's ones. If you're writing with the Noodler's one and your normal writing pressure is not flexing those tines, it's probably going to be a similar type of thing with the Falcon, okay? Now, some of it depends on the writing angle that you might have. You know, you're talking about a gold nib versus a steel nib, so there are going to be some differences there just in the, the way that they flex and stuff. The, the Noodler's nib is stiffer, but Noodler's cuts the slit on that, that nib way higher up to give it the flex. That's how it's designed. The Falcon is more like a conventional looking nib, but the gold, the softness of the gold and the way it's ground and stuff allows it to be softer. So it's kind of working two different ways. So it may just be that some people holding it certain ways will feel softer, some people will not. For me personally, I find them to be fairly close. I would say, if anything, the Falcon is a little bit softer, but you can get more flex out of the Noodler's nib because it is truly designed to be a flex nib, whereas the Falcon is really just meant to be more of a soft nib. I think some people tend to push the limits on what the Falcon is supposed to do. I know sometimes we get returns here from people that have basically ruined their nib by over flexing it. They spring their tines and you know, get them all out of alignment and stuff. And that's a tough thing because a lot of people have put videos out on YouTube and whatnot of using a lot of flex on these Falcons or they get them modified and then shoot videos on them and people don't realize that they're not necessarily meant to be flexed that much on a regular basis and they ruin the nibs. So that's the only thing I caution about with the Falcon. So hopefully that helps you out there. All right. I don't know how to say your name here. Keen or Keen? I'm going to say Keen. K-E-I-N. That is a cool name, Keen, and on Facebook. I have some issues with my Conrad that has a Goulet 1.1 stub on it. When I inked the pen up, there was ink inside the part where the nib and feed fit into the pen. Even though I only screwed the cap halfway through, the cap became too tightened on the body after one or two days. However, despite the tight cap, the ink inside still dried up and I had flow issues afterward. I'm not sure if the issues were connected or if they're independent of each other. What should I do to get it working well? Um, sounds like you got kind of two separate issues here. You got a cap that's really tight and you got the pen that's drying out. Um, so basically the cap being tight thing, you, I think you just tightened it a little too much. So don't do it quite so much. It's definitely not the thing like tightening the cap that much more is going to seal the pen a lot better. I don't think it's really designed that way. There's no insert on that cap that needs to be like cinched down or anything like that. Um, so it's the kind of thing that mm, that's, you know, it's not more is better kind of situation. Once the cap is on there, that's fine. Going really nuts with it is not going to necessarily benefit you much. Um, the drying out thing, part of that is because, you know, in order to have a flex nib on these pens, the feed is ground, not ground, cut to have a really wide ink channel. So that's a really good thing because it allows to keep a really wet flow. So when you're flexing it like crazy, it keeps up. However, when you're using it with a non-flex nib or even with a flex nib, that wide open ink channel allows more exposure to air. It has, because it requires more air to interchange with the ink. So the more ink that's flowing out of the pen, the more air needs to flow in. That's what those part of those fins on the underside of the nib, uh, on the underside of the feed are for is air goes in those and comes up the pen as ink is going out of it, right? Otherwise, it would be kind of like if you have, you know, if you're like uh, drinking a cup of water and you have a straw and you hold the top of the straw and lift it up, the water is going to stay in the straw because there's no air to displace the water as it comes out. It's same thing with a fountain pen. If you don't have an air interchanging going into your ink chamber, 
it's going to be like when you're holding the top of that straw. It's not going to flow through. Okay, so that's what's happening. The more ink flow that is coming through that pen, the more air is going to be getting in there too, and it's going to be drying out the pen. So, in a perfect world, yeah, that cap would be sealed perfectly and all that kind of stuff. But the new these pens do have kind of a reputation for drying out a little bit. There's a couple of things you can do to try to bypass that. You can, you know, seal it into some kind of container, like the cheapest thing is a Ziploc snack bag or something that, that can help, um, especially if you're in a drier environment. I don't have as much an issue of it here in central Virginia because it's humid, it's crud all summer long. It's more of an issue in wintertime when it's really dry. But anyway, um, so it really depends on your environment how drastic it'll be. Um, but it, another thing you can try is to actually if you want to, cut up a small piece of sponge, stick it all the way in your cap and wet it. And it acts like a little humidor inside your cap. So that's another neat little trick that you could try if you're so inclined. You don't want to cut your sponge too big though because then when you put your pen in your cap, if the nib is touching that sponge, it's going to wick a lot of the ink out into the sponge. So you don't really want to do that. Uh, but anyway, so that would be a little hack, a little experimentation to try. Um, but uh, basically what you're doing is about all that you kind of can do. You have to just use it on a regular basis, clean it out. If you're not going to be using it for a little while, you know, clean it out and just let it sit or ink it back up and get it flowing again. All right, Aaron D on Facebook. If you could add any dealer to your line, which would it be and why? Um... There's several different ones I'm considering. I can't say who. Nothing like really firm or like completely impending. We just picked up Faber Costell, so that was kind of the most recent thing that we got. Um, we are working on some other cool things, some other little projects going on that aren't necessarily related to carrying new brands per se. Um, so I am a little preoccupied with that, so I'm not aggressively expanding. Plus, Picking up new lines around this time of year is really not the smartest thing for me to do as a business person because what happens is when the holiday season comes up, all of the manufacturers do a big push to try to release a lot of their new pens because this is the busiest time of year, you know, coming into like October, November, December. So a lot of companies will make their new products, you know, within their existing lines. They'll come out with new models, you know, new colors, new models, whatever, you know, around fall, early winter. So we're gonna be a lot of new stuff coming out anyway. So I don't, you know, if I'm gonna launch a whole new line of pens, a whole new brand, it would be better for me to do that at a time when a lot of the other companies I'm already carrying aren't already coming out with a bunch of cool stuff. So, um, you know, I don't, don't, don't get too excited about like any major new brands uh, on gulaypens.com anytime soon. Um, but I am curious to know if, there was a brand out there that you could get at Goulet that you currently can't, what would that be? I would love to know your opinion because, you know, sometimes it's a matter of, you know, Visconti and Mont Blanc, they just don't want anything to do with us because we're online only. You know, it's unfortunate, but that's just a philosophy that they have about doing business. Um, other companies, it might just be we've looked into them and just haven't really pursued them. You know, we've looked into Cross, we've looked into Diplomat, we've looked into Acme and some other things you know, Retro 51 and some of that kind of stuff. And it's like some of that, I've got contacts. We could carry it if we wanted to. It's just a matter of timing and resources, you know, photography, video, like all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of things that we got to do to carry stuff the way that we do here at Goulet. Um, so I would be really curious to know what you guys want because ultimately it doesn't really matter what I want to carry because I personally don't need many more pens in my collection. It's all about what you want and I'm a retailer. I'm here to serve you and offer you what you want. So I would love to know what that is. So leave me a comment uh, and I would love to know. Okay, Mate F on Facebook. What do you think is the best cartridge out there? Also, what pen would you recommend for no more than $50 that can take Standard International? The best cartridge out there would probably be no cartridge. <laughs> I personally just don't like cartridges, I'm sorry. Um, they're, they're somewhat convenient, but you know, for me, I'm not like traveling all the time, but even when I do, I carry spare ink and sample vials and stuff. It's just, it's not that big of a deal to me to use bottled ink. And the color variety and stuff I can get in bottles are so much better. Just you know, whatever. I just, I don't really care about cartridges that much. This is not my thing. 
Um, so what pen would I recommend for no more than $50 that can take standard international? Okay, um, I, got a, I got a few of them, so I'll talk about some of mine, um, the ones that I carry and I'm familiar with anyway. Um, Jin Hao's got several, the X450, X750, and the 159. Those are all like 10, 12 bucks, you know, really nice to, to get in that kind of standard international, no, definitely below $50 range. Um, the Monteverdi Artista Crystal and the Monteverdi Poquito, those are both pretty affordable and take, take that cartridge. Um, the Monteverdi Impressa is another one that's 40 bucks. Um, heavier pen, very substantial, I like it. Um, and then recently what I just picked up, Faber-Castell, both the Loom and the Basic are standard international as well and are all in that under $50 range. Those are definitely like kind of nice on the nicer end. Um, uh, just like the Impressa is, but you know, you could, you could explore any of those. Those would all be good options for you. Garrison G on Facebook said, Hey Brian, I love your company and thank you and your team for all you've done. My question is, I'm in middle school. What pens do you think are great for me? Once again, thank you. Well, Garrison, that's really cool. I actually really dig the fact that you are so young and showing an interest in fountain pen and that you had the guts to write me a question. That's really cool. Um, I would encourage you to focus on your grammar a little bit, not to pick on you, but that is one thing that younger folks online don't really view as a priority is using proper grammar, punctuation, things like that. You kind of strung together several different things and didn't break it up into sentences for me. So I'm going to leave it just as you typed it here. Um, but that is something that I would strongly encourage you to get into is focusing more on grammar and punctuation because as you get older, people are going to focus less and less on that kind of stuff, but they, even though fewer people are having proper grammar and punctuation and whatnot, there's still an association with level of intelligence with how grammatically correct you are in your written communication, okay? So these days, everybody's texting, everybody's in an LOL and all these shortcuts and whatnot. That is going to affect your ability to operate in a business environment later on in life and just communicate in general with people if you don't focus on that. So not to pick on you too much, and I'm sorry to make an example out of you. But anyway, I still love your question, and I'm going to answer it. Um, so uh, you're in middle school, okay? So I have a video, Fountain Pen 101, Fountain Pens for Students. That's a good one. Um, it's got some pens in the more affordable range that are relatively simple to use that are great kind of introductory pens to get into. I would encourage you to stick with something a little less expensive at first, um, particularly because you are going to have friends that are going to want to borrow your pen. They're not going to know what they're doing with it. They're going to try to write with it and not know how to use it. They might drop it. They might steal it. They might do all kinds of random stuff. So you don't want to spend a lot of money on a pen that you're taking into you know a new environment that people don't know. Like once you have a pen and people know like you have your pen and you just use it and they don't mess with it, then you can get something a little bit nicer and you can kind of guard it a little more closely. Um, or you have like a cheap pen that you carry around with you to use at school and when you're doing your homework at home, then you break out your nicer one and you don't have to worry about carrying it around so much. I definitely do that. When I'm going somewhere and I know that my pen is just going to be like a throw in my pocket pen that I could forget somewhere or somebody could, you know, beat it up or whatever, I take a cheaper pen. You know, I don't carry around a $500 pen with me everywhere I go. Um, you know, I'm very intentional about the pens that I carry to certain places. Um, and then I have another video too that would help you out on um, Brian's top five fountain pens for newbies. Okay, so that is, there's a little bit of overlap between those two videos, but that has kind of the same thing going on as generally students tend to be new into fountain pens as well. So there's a little bit of overlap, but those are both really good videos that I would encourage you to watch. Um, and uh, you know, that's really cool. I'm glad to see that you're young and you're getting into fountain pens. I didn't discover them until I was 25. It would have made school a lot more enjoyable for me if I'd had a really cool pen that I'd enjoyed using. All right, Melanie S on Facebook. Is the Twisby Diamond 580 in red, white, and blue a myth? Why does it keep getting pushed back? I've been waiting since at least August for it. Oh, well, you haven't actually been waiting that long. This pen is, uh, they announced it in the spring. Um, it's been in development for a while. Uh, and it keeps, you're right, it keeps getting pushed back. So as it is right now, um, the pen you're talking about is a Twisby 580 USA. Um, and that is, it's not a myth, okay? Um, it's been in the works for a while. Excuse me, should be a couple more weeks, that's so I'm told. 
It might get pushed back again. I don't think so though. I think this is actually like early October, mid October. I think that's when it's really supposed to come. There's a lot of reasons why it could get pushed back, you know, especially cause you know, um, on the manufacturing side of things with fountain pens, you not only have like the pens and whatnot, but you've got nibs and you've got different components that have to fit together. It has to function properly. It's not just an aesthetic thing. Um, I don't know all the specific ins and outs as to what caused a delay on this pen. I just know that in the past, Twisby has had um, delays on you know just about every pen they've ever released. And it's not even just Twisby. I'm not trying to pick on them at all. They actually do way more than you could ever understand to do what they do. Um, there's so much behind the scenes stuff that is just, you don't even have a clue. Uh, I barely even have a clue. They like peek, they like let me peek in a little bit to their world of manufacturing and I'm like, oh, I get scared and I close the door and I run away. You know, just the, the headaches and the expenses that there are manufacturing at a worldwide level for a brand new product, it is, it is really overwhelming. Just the the sheer magnitude of it all and the number of things that can go wrong, you know, so it's, it could be any host of things. It could be, you know, random little like parts and supplies that they need or raw materials that get delayed because there was a typhoon in some region of some place. And then it washed out the road that the other part was supposed to come, you know, it's just like, there are so many things that go on. It's amazingly complicated in today's global economy. How much is going on? to actually give you a finished product. It's really incredible. So I think personally that, you know, it's not a matter of it's getting delayed and delayed and delayed. I think it's a matter of just like the target date that they're shooting for is too early, you know, early on. And they're, they're estimating to the best of their ability. They can't anticipate all this random stuff. Really the only alternative would be to like completely hide the product from it being in existence at all until it's like pretty much ready to go. You know, and that's that's what I've done in the past here. I, the stuff that we manufacture here at Goulet, like brass sheets and Goulet grip and the ink syringes and all that kind of stuff, um, is so like light duty compared to what pen companies are doing. Um, but even still, that stuff, like when I've come out with those products, I don't hype it up in advance. I prototype it and, and gosh, some of the stuff that we've done, like like even to find the loops that we did. It took us like six months to find, uh, we had to test out like a lot of different loops, find reliable suppliers, just and the packaging for that thing is, is not that great. And I realized that, but even just searching out companies that serve boxes, that do boxes and the right finish and size and stuff of what you need. And then to get marketing, you know, stickers and logos and all that kind of stuff. Like it's just, it's a lot. There's a lot of stuff there. It's a lot of logistics and it's really complicated. So, um, that that has been my approach and that alone has been enough to, to tell me like I do not want to manufacture my own pens from scratch. It's just so complicated. Um, but anyway, long story short, they're coming out soon. Give some grace to Twisby. Give some grace to these other manufacturers when they say that something's coming out and then it gets delayed because stuff is so amazingly complicated and it's not like these are electronic components where there's all these suppliers and they can just get a, get a supply from another a random part from another supplier if they if this one doesn't work out. These are these are small companies, very niche market. If there's a delay on one piece, it's going to delay the whole thing. So that's why stuff gets pushed back is cuz fountain pens are a relatively small industry and it just takes time. All right, Carrie S on Facebook. I know it's possible to special order pens. Is it possible to order a specific ink as well? Well, anything is possible, but it's usually not very practical. We've dabbled in special ordering ink before. Well, first off, we carry pretty much the full line of ink of every brand that we have. The only stuff that we don't carry the entire line is is pretty much just diatrementous because they have all this stuff and we kind of touched on it earlier. They have like the people inks and the, the flower and all this other stuff. 
there's a lot of overlap between those colors. And when we first got into the brand, we carried like two thirds of everything they had. A lot of stuff didn't sell because it was too similar and people got confused. And so we just started dropping stuff that wasn't as selling as well. And so now we carry like, I don't know, a little less than half their line probably, but they're coming out with new stuff all the time and their catalog is enormous. Um, so, you know, that's one of the only ink companies that I can think that we get requests to special order. The only other things that people ask to special order is like large size bottles of Noodler's ink. I did a video a couple of years ago about that. However, Nathan's capacity to make large size bottles is just not there anymore. He's just, he's too busy. And I refuse to take orders on them anymore because if Nathan makes one large bottle of 32 ounce Noodler's black or whatever, that's an entire case of three ounce bottles that he could have made in that same time. So it's for the betterment of everyone because he is such a constrained resource that I don't take orders for those large size bottles anymore. Um, but yeah, that's, I really can't think. And I guess the only other requests would be if there were um, inks that, you know, from brands that we don't have. So, and those we really can't special order because we, we're not set up for, for retailing their stuff for one reason or another. You know, I talked about Visconti Mont Blanc a minute ago. Well, I can't special order you Visconti ink because they don't want to sell me their stuff. So I can't, I can't offer it to you. So there's really not a lot of opportunity to take special orders for ink. Um, I guess as I'm, as I'm thinking, the other example of taking a special order, I guess would be like a pre-order, like the 1670 Jerobon Rouge, Hem or not Rouge Hematite, the Stormy Gray that's coming out. Technically, if I did a special order for that, it's not an ink that's out yet that would be a pre-order, not a special order. So some people might call it a special order, but we don't do pre-orders on ink either. Um, we don't do pre-orders for anything. We got burned on that early on, early on, like months into our business when J. Ron Rouge Hematite first came out. We took pre-orders and we, there were more people that wanted the ink than ink we got. So we had taken and we committed to be, we didn't take the money. Thankfully, we were smart enough not to actually take people's money to reserve the ink, but we had just had a wait list going. And what happened is we'd get a shipment of that ink in and we had said, okay, we've got you on the wait list. All the ink that we had come in was already committed to. So it never listed on our website. No one else even had the chance to get the ink. So early on, we got away from that process. Now what we do for pre-order type situations is we say, if it's, if it's really gonna be that big of a deal and that limited of a quantity, we say, hey, look, we're gonna list it at such and such time, first come, first serve, you get your ducks in a row and you go buy it, you know, put yourself on the email notification list, you'll know as soon as it's in, otherwise, I'm sorry. You know, that's the only way we can manage it with some of these limited products. Now, the Stormy Gray, that particular one is not gonna be, I don't think it's gonna be that situation. It is gonna be a popular ink, but I think there's a good supply of it that's supposed to be coming. I think that's why it was delayed a little bit. They're trying to stock up more on it before they release it uh, because of all the hype that's come around it. So um, that's kind of where I stand there. But I'd be curious to know, just leave in the comments, I'd be curious to know what ink uh, you'd be interested in special ordering um, that I haven't already covered here in this question. All right, just a couple more left, bear with me. Lori P on Facebook said, when will Lamy announce the new colors for 2015? Um, well, the Lamy Studio, they just announced the Lamy Studio Wild Rubin Special Edition. So that, you know, is a red, a little bit of pink to it. I just put out a video on that two days ago. Um, that one is um, the most recent one and the only one actually that I knew was coming in the future. So. I'm sure they're gonna come out with some kind of limited edition, not, not limited edition, sorry. When I, generally I found in, in the fountain pen world, when limited edition is used, it tends to mean that it's numbered and it's restricted to a certain number that they sell. Special edition means it's a special color. They'll do it for a period of time or a, a run of a certain length or quantity. It's not numbered and they just, it just sells out when it sells out. So this Wild Rubin is a special edition pen. Um, that one should be coming around mid-October. Um, but for 2015, I haven't, got, I haven't heard any information about what's coming. I'm sure based on Lamy's performance in the last several years that I've been carrying their stuff, I'm sure there is something coming. Um, often they come out with something March or April-ish, um, usually in the Safari or All-Star 
color. It's every couple of years they'll do a studio. Um, and since they just did Wild Reuben, I'd be really surprised if they did another studio for 2015 because Wild Reuben is going to be selling for, it, you know, it's, only, it's coming out mid-October. It's going to sell well into 2015. Um, so I don't know what they'll be coming out with. I have been telling them over and over again, please come out with a purple safari. Like, please do that. It's never been done. Why don't you do it? Like, come on. So I don't know. We'll see if they listen. If they came out with a purple safari this year, I'd be thrilled. But I really I have no idea what they could or will come out with. But I'm sure it'll be something. Last question for this week. Sean D on Facebook. Any chance if you'll be getting in the Rodian number 80 dot pads? If so, when and what will the price be? Okay, so the number 80 pads, the numbering is a little confusing. So Rodeo is in their 80th anniversary. That's what the number 80 means, okay? So they came out in 1934 and here it is, 2014, number 80. That's where the number 80 comes from. All the rest of their Rodeo pads, the number actually corresponds somewhat to the size. So you go to a Rodeo number 10 pad, it's the smallest. Number 11 is bigger, 12 is bigger, 13, 16, 18, 19, 38, 38 is the huge one that's A3 size. It's massive. It's like two number 19 pads next to each other. It's enormous. Um, it's incredibly expensive to ship. That's why we don't sell it. Um, but anyway, they came out with the number 80, which if you went with the same logic, the number 80 should be, you know, it technically should be a number 76, I guess, because if it's two A3 pads together, that would be an A2 size. That thing would be massive, right? It'd be like two feet by three feet. It'd be... Yeah, even bigger than that. No, it'd be like three feet by five feet or something crazy. It would be really huge. Um, but anyway, the number 80 does not go in line with the numbering system of the rest of the Rodeo pads. It's a number 16 pad with a pencil and it's got a special cover and, and, that's, and it comes in a box. So we will be carrying it probably at some point. We're holding off right now just because we got a lot of irons in the fire. Um, we haven't had people beating down our doors for it. I think it's available right now. Um, like other retailers probably have it available. I think it's around $10. You know, so you're paying a little bit of a premium and we don't have like a huge pencil crowd, which is why it hasn't been like, oh my gosh, yes, it's such an obvious choice for us. Like, yes, it's a Rodeo product. We carry a lot of the Rodeo line, just about everything. Um, so it wouldn't seem kind of natural that we would carry it, but I don't know, if people really start beating down our doors for it, we will, but we haven't had people beating down our doors for it yet, so we're kind of holding off a little bit until some of these other projects we're working on get wrapped up, and then we can focus a little more on that. But um, if you are really dying for it, other retailers should have it. So I hate to say that, but it's the truth. If I'm not offering it, I'm not even giving you a chance to buy it from me. So it's kind of my own fault. So um, that's about it for this week. Next week's Q&A will be number 50. And that's pretty cool. So I don't really have any plans to do anything special with that. But I don't know, 50 is a cool, nice round number. So it's kind of neat. Um, if you have any questions that you want me to answer next week, I'm just going to do another open forum so you can ask me whatever you want. Um, you can email me at gouletqa at gouletpens.com. You can leave a comment on YouTube or on Inc. Nouveau under this blog post. Um, you can hit us up on Twitter at goulet, hashtag gouletqa um, or on uh, Facebook once we post asking for questions early next week. Um, and, you know, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there to I... I started the Goulet Pens Twitter handle years ago, like actually before we even started selling fountain pen products. Um, I was on Twitter. That's actually, believe it or not, how I made contact first with Exaclair, who sells Rodia, Claire Fontaine, J.R. Bond. Um, I made the contact through Twitter. So, tw you know, Twitter is, we've been on Twitter for quite a while. Um, we got a pretty good following on the at Goulet Pens, um, you know, uh, handle. And, you know, we've been doing that for years. Um, I'm actually not managing that during the day. Alex, um, our community manager, she's been with us for three years and she's really social media savvy. No, she, she started out in our customer care, knows her products inside and out. She is awesome on Twitter. And like, I just don't have as much time to be on there during the day like I would. So 
once she started to kind of take that over, it was the, the handle became a little bit less of my Twitter handle and it was really kind of more the company Twitter handle because you got to th figure in the early days of the business, Rachel and I did not anticipate growing this beyond just her and I. Really, we didn't. We thought it was just going to be the two of us running our little business. So for me, it was like, oh, I'm Goulet Pens. You know, that was my Fountain Pen Network name. You know, it still is. Rachel is Mrs. Goulet Pens, you know what I mean? And uh, so as we've grown and as Alex has kind of cultivated this community manager, you know, position, she's handed over some of this stuff, but it's kind of like ambiguous now, like, oh gosh, like I'm like the face of Goulet and I do the videos and do, a, I'm obviously very involved in everything that goes on here, but it's like, I'm not actually doing all the work. Clearly we have a staff of 26 with 27th as a part-time guys helping us out. So it's a big team here that it takes to do everything that we do. So it's like, gosh, that's kind of weird now. So what I, what I did is I set up a personal Twitter handle. So my personal Twitter handle is at Brian Goulet underscore. At Brian Goulet was already taken by a guy who's not even tweeting anything. Go figure. So at Brian Goulet underscore is my personal Twitter handle. And I haven't really put it out there that much because I'll be completely honest, like, I'm just not on Twitter religiously. Maybe if I like put it out there that, hey, I'm on Twitter, you can hit me up and we'll have more of a reason to have a conversation. But for me, it's just like, I've already got a million things to manage in my life and Twitter is kind of like another little facet that it's like, if I'm not on it and managing it regularly, I feel like it's like, dang it, like there's something else I'm not able to do that I want to do. So I haven't really like been on it as much as I could. And like Gary Vee is a huge inspiration for me and he's like Mr. Twitter and all over it. And so I'm thinking to myself like, I mean, I really should be on it more, but it's like, you know, I don't know. But anyway, I just wanted to put it out there. If you want to hit me up, my personal Twitter handle, at Brian Goulet underscore, you know, follow me, whatever, if you like what I do. I don't post a ton of stuff, but I'm more than happy to engage with you there. If you're talking to me there, I'll talk back to you. You know, I'm around. So I'm also managing like the YouTube comments and the blog comments and stuff. And I've been like, falling apart on that a little bit. We've had a lot going on. I'll be able to explain more about that in the coming weeks, but had a lot of irons in the fire. But anyway, just in case you want to do it, you know, I'm there. So I hope you have a wonderful week. Hope you enjoyed this Q&A. Um, hit me up with some questions and I am more than happy to answer them next week. Have a wonderful weekend and right on.